Milkweed by Jerry Spinelli Chapter 1 Memory I am running. That's the first thing I remember. Running. I carry something, my arm curled around it, hugging it to my chest. Bread. Of course, someone is chasing me. Stop! Thief! I run. People. Shoulders. Shoes. Stop! Thief! Sometimes it is a dream. Sometimes it is a memory in the middle of the day as I stir iced tea or wait for soup to heat. I never see who is chasing and calling me. I never stop long enough to eat the bread. When I awaken from dream or memory, my legs are tingling. Chapter 2 Summer He was dragging me, running. He was much bigger. My feet skimmed over the ground. Sirens were screaming. His hair was red. We flew through streets and alleyways. There were thumping noises like distant thunder. The people we bounced off didn't seem to notice us. The sirens were screaming like babies. At last we plunged into a dark hole. You're lucky, he said. Soon it won't be ladies chasing you. It will be jackboots. Jackboots, I said. You'll see. I wondered who the jackboots were. Were unfooted boots running along the streets? Okay, he said. Hand it over. Hand what over, I said. He reached into my shirt and pulled out the loaf of bread. He broke it in half. He shoved one at me and began to eat the other. You're lucky I didn't kill you, he said. That lady you took this from? I was just getting ready to snatch it for myself. I'm lucky, I said. He burped. You're quick. You took it before I even knew what happened. The lady was rich. Did you see the way she was dressed? She'll just buy ten more. I ate my bread. More thumping sounds in the distance. What is that? I asked him. Jackboot artillery, he said. What's artillery? Big guns. Boom, boom. They're shelling the city. He stared at me. Who are you? I didn't understand the question. I'm Yuri, he said. What's your name? I gave him my name. Stop, thief. Chapter 3 He took me to meet the others. We were in a stable. The horses were there. Usually they would be out on the streets, but they were home now because the jackboots were boom, boom, booming the city, and it was too dangerous for horses. We sat in a stall near the legs of a sad-faced gray. The horse pooped. Two of the kids got up and went to the next stall, another horse. A moment later came the sound of water splashing on straw. The two came back. One of them said, I'll take the poop. Where did you find him, said a boy smoking a cigarette. Down by the river, said Yuri. He snatched a loaf from a rich lady coming out of the bread box. Another boy said, why didn't you snatch it from him? This one was smoking a cigar as long as his face. Yuri looked at me. I don't know. He's a runt, someone said. Look at him. Stand up, said someone else. I looked at Yuri. Yuri flicked his finger. I stood. Go there, someone said. I felt a foot on my back, pushing me toward the horse. See, said the cigar smoker. He doesn't even come halfway up to the horse's dumper. A voice behind me squalled. The horse could dump a new hat on him. Everyone, even Yuri, howled with laughter. Explosions went off beyond the walls. The boys who were not smoking were eating. In the corner of the stable was a pile as tall as me. There was bread in all shapes and sausages of all lengths and colors and fruits and candies, but only half of it was food. All sorts of other things glittered in the pile. I saw watches and combs and ladies' lipsticks and eyeglasses. I saw the thin, flat face of a fox peering out. What's his name, said someone. Yuri nodded at me. Tell them your name. Stop, thief, I said. Someone crowed. It speaks! Smoke burst from the mouths as the boys laughed. One boy did not laugh. He carried a cigarette behind each ear. I think he's cuckoo. Another boy got up and came over to me. He leaned down. He sniffed. He pinched his nose. He smells. He blew smoke into my face. Look, someone called. Even the smoke can't stand him. It's turning green. They laughed. The smoke, the smoke blower backed off. So, stop, thief. Are you a smelly cuckoo? I didn't know what to say. He's stupid, said the unlaughing boy. He'll get us in trouble. He's quick, said Yuri, and he's little. He's a runt. Runt is good, said Yuri. Are you a Jew, said the boy in my face. I don't know, I said. He kicked my foot. How can you not know? You're a Jew, or you're not a Jew. I shrugged. I told you, he's stupid, said the unlaugher. 
He's young, said Yuri. He's just a little kid. How old are you, said the smoke blower. I don't know, I said. The smoke blower threw up his hands. Don't you know anything? He's stupid. He's a stupid Jew. A smelly stupid Jew. A tiny smelly stupid Jew. More laughter. Each time they laughed, they threw food at each other and at the horse. The smoke blower pressed my nose with the tip of his finger. Can you do this? He leaned back until he was facing the ceiling. He puffed on the cigarette until his cheeks, even his eyes, were bulging. His face looked like a balloon. It was grinning. I was sure he was going to destroy me with his face full of smoke, but he didn't. He turned to the horse, lifted its tail, and blew a stream of silvery smoke at the horses behind. The horse nickered. Everyone howled, even the unlaffer, even me. The pounding in the distance was like my heartbeat after running. He must be a Jew, someone said. What's a Jew, I said. I'll answer the runt, someone said. Tell him what a Jew is. The unlaffer kicked ground straw at a boy who hadn't spoken. The boy had only one arm. That's a Jew, he pointed to himself. This is a Jew, he pointed to the others. That's a Jew, that's a Jew, that's a Jew. He pointed to the horse. That's a Jew. He fell to his knees and scrabbled in the straw near the horse flop. He found something. He held it out to me. It was a small brown insect. This is a Jew. Look. Look. He startled me. A Jew is an animal. A Jew is a bug. A Jew is less than a bug. He threw the insect into the flop. A Jew is that. Others cheered and clapped. Yeah, yeah. I'm a horse turd. I'm a goose turd. A boy pointed at me. He's a Jew, all right. Look at him. He's a Jew if I ever saw one. Yeah, he's in for it, all right. I looked at the boy who spoke. He was munching on a sausage. What am I in for, I said. He snorted. Strawberry babka. We're all in for it, said someone else. We're in for good. Speak for yourself, said the unlaffer. He came and stood before me. He reached down and fingered the yellow stone hung around my neck on a string. What's this, he said. I don't know, I said. Where did you get it? I always had it. He let go of the stone. He backed off to arm's length. He wet his finger and spit and rubbed my cheek. He's a gypsy. There were gasps of wonder. The others leaned forward, munching, puffing their tobaccos. How do you know? Look at his eyes. How black. And his skin. And this. He flicked the yellow stone. The smoke blower said, You're a gypsy, ain't you? It sounded familiar. I had heard that word before around me in a room near a wagon. I nodded. Get him out of here, said the sausage muncher. We don't need gypsies. They're dirt. The smoke blower laughed. Look who's talking. The one-armed boy spoke for the first time. Next to Jews, they hate gypsies the most. There's a difference, said another. Everybody doesn't hate the gypsies, but there's nobody that doesn't hate us. Nobody is hated close to us. They even hate us in Washington, America. Because we boil babies and eat them for matzah, someone growled scarily. Everyone laughed and threw food. We drink people's blood. We suck their brains out through their noses with the straw. Even cannibals hate us. Even monkeys hate us. Even cockroaches hate us. Words and laughter and bread and sausages flew through the tobacco smoke and the horse's legs. Hands reached for the pile. Golden bracelets flew and jars of jam and tiny painted animals and fountain pens. The flanks of the horse flickered as they were pelted. A white and purple glass fish bounced off my forehead. The fox fur flew. One boy paraded wearing it about his shoulders, kissing its snout. And then the stablesman was coming and shouting and we were running and outside we scattered like cockroaches. And I ran with Yuri and the thumping explosions were louder and the clouds in the sky were brown and black. We ran through streets and alleyways to the back of a small brick building. Yuri threw open a wooden hatch, and we plunged into a dark, cool cellar. Yuri pulled down the hatch, snipping off the daylight. Then he flipped a switch, and a bare light bulb burned among the cobwebs in the ceiling. Yuri pointed upward. It's a barber shop. The barber went. He left everything. I'll show you tomorrow. The cellar was a home. Carpets covered the floor. There was a bed and a chair and a radio and a chest of drawers, even an ice box. Tonight you sleep on the floor, he said. Tomorrow I'll get you a bed. 
The explosion stopped, or maybe I just couldn't hear them anymore. We ate bread and jam and slices of salty meat. I said, what am I in for? He did not look at me. You heard. Strawberry babka. Eat. Chapter 4 When I awoke the next morning, Yuri was gone. He returned dragging a mattress. It was small, about half the size of his, but plenty big enough for me. I lay down on it. He jerked me to my feet and snapped. Not yet. He hauled me outside. We walked to the sh shopping district where the big stores were. Except some of them were not so big now. The bombardment had left them crumples of brick. Looking down the street, I saw spaces where stores should be, little bro like broken teeth. We went behind the stores to alleyways of trucks and trash bins and st start staring cats. Yuri said, wait here. He disappeared in a maze of air shafts and fire escapes and doors. And when he came out, it, his arms were loaded with clothes. For you, he said. I reached. Don't touch. Follow me. He led me to a bombed out building, nothing but the back wall standing. We climbed over a jumble of bricks and splintered wood and twisted pipe. Watch the glass, he said. I kept stumbling over the heads and arms of mannequins. We came to a lopped off stairway. Yuri tested it. Okay, he said. We went down into the rubble. Whenever he came to a knob in a pipe, he turned it. Some gave out steam, some nothing. We stopped at one that gave water. Take those rags off, he said. I took off my clothes. He laid down the new ones and went rooting through the rubble. He returned with a mannequin's leg and a scrub brush. He filled the leg with water. I'm not thirsty, I said. He dumped the water over me. He began to scrub me with the brush. At first it felt wonderful. Then it didn't. Leg after leg of water he poured over me. After the scrub brush got down to the soles of my feet, he started again on my face. He grunted as he scrubbed. I squirmed. I cried out. He was scrubbing my skin off. At last he stopped. Baby, he said. He dried me with a shirt. I screamed in pain from the rubbing. He patted the rest of me dry. He glared at me. Did you ever have a bath? I stared at him. Didn't think so. Then he dressed me in a clean shirt and two big pants. People gave us looks as we climbed out of the rubble and onto the sidewalk. By the time we were halfway home, I was feeling terrific. I felt new. I felt the air, the sun on my skin. Yuri brought his nose to my neck and sniffed. He nodded. Back in the cellar, we ate sugar cookies and jars of plums and syrup. Then he led me upstairs to the barber shop. I had never been in a barber shop. He was right. The barber had left everything. Rows of colored liquid, green, red, blue, lined the shelf beneath a great mirror. You never had your hair cut, did you? No, I said. Have a seat. I climbed into the red padded chair. He spun me around till I got dizzy. He pumped a lever and I rose higher. He shook out a large cloth and draped it over me. From a glass canister, he pulled a comb and scissors and began. he began combing and snipping. Soon my hair was like fur. All right, he said. Which one? Which one, I echoed. He pointed to the bottles. I did not understand why I should be offered a drink after having my hair cut, but I didn't argue. I had learned never to turn down food. I pointed to the blue, that one. To my surprise, he did not give me a drink, but instead poured the blue liquid over my head. He shuffled his fingers through my hair and then combed it. It became wet and shiny. Outside, people hurried this way and that. Many carried shovels. Are they going to a farm, I said? They're digging trenches to stop the tanks, he said. What's a tank? You'll see. Soldiers marched and ran and blew whistles. People carried large fat bags. They must have been heavy, for one person could carry only one at a time over his shoulders. If you had a wheelbarrow, you could take three. What's in the bags, I said. Sand. I found out where the bags of sand went. I saw them stacked in front of the machine guns and doorways and on roofs and at the ends of streets. We hopped to streetcars that rattled down the tracks. We got footholds on the outside and clung to window posts. The window blew through my new hair. Passengers frowned at us. Get off, they said. Look, said Yuri. A boy was running along the sidewalk at the same speed as us. It was the boy who blew smoke in my face. His arms were wrapped around a lump of pure white glass in the shape of a naked woman. The lampshade fell off, but he kept running, weaving in and out of people. I looked behind him. 
A man was chasing him, shouting, Stop him! Yuri swung out from the side of a streetcar like a gate. He waved. Hey, Kuba! Kuba looked over as he ran. Hey, Yuri! It was then that someone stuck out a foot and tripped him. Kuba went sprawling, and the pure white naked woman shattered on the sidewalk. Get him! Someone yelled, and the sidewalk people converged on Kuba. They won't get him, Yuri said. As the streetcar rattled on down the tracks, I saw someone swing a leg out and kick. And then Kuba was popping from the crowd and racing toward the street, and the people hurled curses and laughter after him. Yuri shook his head grimly. Stupid! Stupid! They take everything, just to take it. He looked at me as the streetcar clanged above us. Take only what you need, you hear? He pinched my nose and, until my eyes watered. I howled, yes! For a moment the passengers had forgotten us as they stared at the excitement on the sidewalk. Now they remembered us. A man in the silver necktie snarled, Go! Get off! A little boy stuck out his tongue, and then a woman in, fox, in a fox fur came down the aisle and reached over the seats and drew down the window on Yuri's hands. I screamed, but Yuri didn't. The fox's eyes were like little black marbles. The lady reached over to bring down my window, too, but she stopped because there was a loud sound, and it wasn't the clang of the streetcar. It was sirens. Ahead of us, a, a shop exploded in a gush of flame. People screamed. The streetcar gasped and jerked to a halt. Within moments, it was empty. Even the driver was gone, running with the crowds in the street. And then the streets were empty. A strange music filled the air. The sirens wail and the thump of exploding shells. I pulled myself up into the streetcar. I opened the window that clamped Yuri's fingers. He fell to the ground and in a moment appeared at the door. He threw his hands in the air and cheered, Finally! I thought he was celebrating the release of his fingers, but it was something else. I always wanted to drive one of these. He sat in the driver's seat. He stared at the controls. He pushed one thing, pulled another. The streetcar jerked into movement and we were heading down the tracks. What a ride. Yuri turned the steering stick this way and that. He learned how to make it go faster, then faster, and the streetcar screamed along with us through the deserted city. Smoke rose beyond the rooftops, as if giants were puffing cigars. He showed me where to pull the clanger, and I pulled and pulled, and the clanging joined the music of the bombardment. At last we came to a loop, where the streetcar was meant to turn around, but Yuri did not slow down, and the streetcar leaped from the tracks, and it was like riding a house into other houses. We smashed into a restaurant, plowed through a field of red tablecloths, into the kitchen with an ear-ripping clatter, and still there were no people and no one to yell, Stop! Stop! Sauerkraut splattered across the windshield as we came to a halt against the, o the ovens. By now, the streetcar was on its side, and we were hanging from our places. Yuri was howling like a wolf, and even as the oven chimney pipes toppled like trees, I laughed and pulled and pulled the clanger rope. Chapter 5 Autumn Soon the airplanes came, adding their waspy buzz to the music. I wanted to see them, but Yuri would not let me go outside. Why can't we go out, I said. They're dropping bombs, he said. I thought, that is, this is what the enemy does. He flies overhead in the airplane. If he sees you in the street below, he reaches out and drops a bomb on your head. I pictured bombs as black iron balls about the size of a sauerkraut kettle. Every day the sirens screamed to tell us the bombs were coming. We stayed in the cellar and went out at night. That's when I learned the reality of bombs. Beyond the rooftops the city was on fire. It looked like the sun was struck. Those were the days and nights. On some nights we were a city of two. We did not have to snatch. We simply walked into the empty shops of bakers and butchers and grocers and took whatever we pleased and walked out and walked home. We did not run. The street lights were out. Sometimes in the night we went to the stable. The others were there. Everyone put food into a big pile. We wrestled in the food before we ate it. We climbed. We clubbed each other blindly with arm-long sausages. Cigarette tips glowed orange in the dark. The horses were gone. The stableman never came shouting any more. Then one day the sirens were silent. Yuri and I were home, in our basement. Yuri said, stay here. 
and went outside, and when he came back, he said, Let's go. He stuffed a cheese into his pocket and one into mine, and we went up through the barber shop and into the street. We walked fast. I couldn't keep up. Yuri took my hand and pulled me. People were out. They were heading the this they were heading the way we were going. We passed the black twisted skeletons of streetcars. Sometimes we had to trot down the middle of the street because the walls of buildings had crumpled and spilled over the sidewalks. Stacks of sandbags were everywhere. People were hurrying. Machine guns looked to me like praying mantises. Airplanes flew overhead, but no bombs fell from them. I saw someone running. That was all I needed. I could not walk if someone else was running. I broke loose from Yuri. Others were running. It was a race. I didn't know where the finish line was, but I was determined to win. Many had shouted, Stop! But no one had ever caught me. The street was getting more and more crowded as people poured into it. I streaked through the crowds. I passed other runners. I didn't care how many there were. I would beat them all. I laughed as I ran. Then I was aware of a noise. I felt it before I heard it. It was deep and grumbling and seemed to come from beneath the streets. And there was another sound. It was like the beat of a great drum, or a thousand drums. And the more I ran, the louder it became. And now the people were mobbed, piled like bombed bricks, the spaces between them gone. But I found spaces, I always found spaces, and I darted through them. I could taste the finish line. Suddenly I broke free. I burst out of the mob. I was in nothing but space, and the drum beat was deafening. I won, I shouted, and threw up my hands in victory. And then something hit me on the ear, and I was on the ground, and the drum beat was rolling over me. I looked up, and I saw boots. The tallest, blackest, shiniest boots I had ever seen. Endless columns. For an instant, for an instant I saw my gaping face in one of them. I knew what I must be seeing. Yuri had spoken often of them. I gasped aloud. Jack boots! They were magnificent. There were men attached to them, but it was as if the boots were wearing the men. They did not walk like ordinary footwear, the boots. When one stood at tall, stiff attention, the other swung straight out till it was high. So high I could have walked under it, and then did it. only then did it return to earth and the other take off. A thousand of them swing, swinging up as one, falling like the footstep of a single thousand-footed giant. Leaves leaped. The parade of jackboots went on forever. Yuri told me later that the streets of the parade was so wonderfully wide it was not even called a street but a boulevard. And then I was in the air. A hand had hoisted me up, and I was dangling above the street and returned to my feet. A soldier was smiling down at me. His boots came to my shoulder, and his gray uniform was piped and spangled with silver. The brim of the hat was black and shiny, like the boots. Above it glistened a silver bird that I knew the boys in the stable would have loved to steal. The soldier smiled down at me. He mussed my hair and pinched my cheek. Tiny little Jew, he said. Happy to see us, are you? I'm not a Jew, I told him. I held up my yellow stone. I'm a gypsy. My reply delighted him. Ha ha, so a gypsy, good, very good. And he took me under both arms and lifted me and deposited me back in the sidewalk at the front of the crowd. Well, good day, little gypsy, he said, and then the smile left his face, and he stood tall, and the heels of the boots snapped together with a clack, and he saluted me and marched off. The march of the boot, jack boots went on and on. After a while, Yuri found me. Look, I said, the jack boots. I thought he would cheer, but he did not. He stood behind me with his hands on my shoulders. I looked at the faces of the crowd. No one was cheering or even smiling. I was surprised. Weren't they thrilled by the spectacle before them? And now the deep grumbling was getting louder and beginning to overcome the drumbeat of the jackboots. I had always looked to the sky for thunder, but this thunder was coming from beneath my feet. The street itself was trembling, and then I saw them. Yuri, I cried. Tanks, he said. Colossal, gray, long-snouted beetles. The tanks roared up the boulevard four by four, and the sky shook on its hinges. And I saw at once how silly it had been to try to stop them with ditches and sandbags and machine guns. I clamped my hands over my ears. A single white flower flew out of the crowd. It bounced from the iron flank of a tank and broke into petals. I had no flower, so I threw my cheese. <laughs>